Usually I cover pretty story heavy games, but I wanted to branch out and try something different. Today, we're going to be talking about Sly Cooper, a game with some of the coolest and most unique movement I've ever experienced and the second game that I ever played. Because of this, it's a huge part of my childhood. Sly Cooper is a stealth platformer developed by Sucker Punch Productions back in 2002. It follows a ragtag team of thieves trying to steal back a valuable family heirloom from a group of criminals. It's hard to talk about this game without just delving right into the details, so let's just get started. Atop the roof of police headquarters in Paris, the Cooper gang are planning to make a risky move. They have three members, Sly, the thief, Bentley, the brains, and Murray, the brawn. They plan to break into the building to steal a file containing information on a criminal organization known as the Fiendish Five. You play as Sly, with Bentley keeping an eye on you remotely and Murray acting as your getaway driver. The thing I initially found the coolest about the game were the thieving moves. Whenever you see blue sparkles somewhere, you can just interact with it by using the circle button. This makes it possible to do everything from some mundane ledge walking to ninja spire jumps and parkour with Sly's cane. The art style feels straight out of a freaking comic book. It's cell shaded and very moody since it's always nighttime, with just enough light to see where you're going while still allowing an artistic emphasis on light sources like windows and neon signs. The creators publicly stated that they wanted the world of their game to look illustrated, which they completely nailed. Sly navigates through a laser trap and creeps along a ledge to break into Inspector Carmelita's office. She's been after Sly for quite some time. Bentley utilizes his hacking skills to get the code for the vault with the file they need. The second Sly steps outside to make his escape, the inspector pounces on him, shooting at him with a stun pistol. Thanks to some quick acrobatics and Murray being at the wheel, the Cooper gang manages to make their getaway. The file that they acquired is on Sly himself, detailing his past. Sly comes from a long line of master thieves. They document all of their experience and techniques in a book called The Thievius Raccoonus. Understandably, anyone who knew about this book wanted to get their hands on it. This caused the previously aforementioned group of criminals to show up and steal it, tearing it into five separate parts and killing everyone but Sly himself. Sly was quickly put into an orphanage, his only belonging being a cane passed down from his father. Here, he met his two best friends, Bentley and Murray. With all known information on the Fiendish Five contained within his file, the Cooper gang is finally ready to steal back the Thievius Raccoonus. This is a really simple but charming plot. It works well for what it tries to be. There are three characters with distinct personalities, a clear motive, and interesting villains and settings. I do wish they developed Murray and Bentley more in this first game, but they more than make up for it in every single sequel. Just about all of the writing improves drastically as the series goes on. The gang's first target is Sir Raleigh, a pirate and a talented engineer. He was last spotted off the coast of a small island, completely engulfed in a storm. This here is the first actual level, where the main mechanics are far better explained. You jump with X, attack with square, use thief moves with circle, and use special abilities with triangle. Sly doesn't have a health bar, meaning any mistake that you make results in an instantaneous death. You can combat this using lucky charms. These can be collected by either finding them laying around or by gathering a hundred coins. A silver charm gives you one extra hit, while a gold one gives you two. I don't think the levels themselves are that bad with the one hit system, but the boss fights can be horrible because of that. If you make a single mistake, you start all the way from the beginning at phase one. I'll give some more specific examples as we approach the actual boss fights. You've probably seen these green bottles scattered around. These are clue bottles containing information that Bentley can use to crack the codes for vaults around each world. These vaults contain pages from the Thievius Raccoonus, giving Sly access to special moves you can activate with Triangle. The first level nets us the Dive move, allowing Sly to propel himself forward in a spiral while dealing damage. With that introductory level finished, we move to the World 1 hub area. Sly has to destroy a generator to move on, which he can only do after gathering an assortment of treasure keys. Well, that's not necessarily true. You can actually bait a guard into destroying it with an attack by jumping from the roof at the right time, but that's no fun when you're trying to 100% the game like I am. Sly gathers the three keys and moves to the next segment of the hub area, where we get our first taste of mini-games. Sly Cooper isn't all about platforming, there are many different varieties of vehicle levels we have to do. The one in Raleigh's world allows us to pilot a submarine while fighting off crabs. This is a good segue into one big issue with playing Sly Cooper in the modern era. That being that there isn't really a great way to do it. If you have a PS2 or a PS3 as well as a physical copy of the game, you're all good to go, but those can be really hard to come by without going broke depending on your current circumstances. 
because of that, emulation tends to be the best option. But unfortunately, that means that there tend to be a lot of glitches. From the circle button occasionally not working no matter which controller I tried, to vehicle segments inverting one axis of my right analog stick, there were a lot of problems. I managed to beat this first segment with the inverted controls, but later on I just remapped the analog stick during the minigames and changed it back afterwards. It's time for the first boss fight. Sly unlocks a cannon with his treasure keys and launches himself into Raleigh's blimp, which Bentley believes is actually a storm machine causing terrible weather around his base and preventing ships from safely getting anywhere near him. How delightful! We have a guest. The only thing is... I hate unexpected guests! Listen, Raleigh, wipe up my family and steal what's mine, you better expect company. Oh, I'm ever so sorry. How sloppy of me not to finish the job. Obviously, we should have snuffed you out as well. So, without further ado, let me make amends by what? Bloating to gargantuan size and squashing you like the insignificant bug that you are. Bring it on. Whoever the heck voices Raleigh absolutely killed it. What a great performance. This fight isn't all that difficult once you get used to it. You dodge his bounces, wait for him to uninflate, and then smack him with your cane. You do this for a few rounds until he switches to a completely different attack pattern, spinning around with his tongue out like a whip. Blast it off! You! Beaten me! Well, gloat all you want, Sly Cooper. You're no match for Mugshot, my villainous cohort in Utah. You'll see. Mesa City is so well guarded, a snake! couldn't slither in without setting off alarms. <laughs> Thanks to Raleigh's need to dramatically monologue, the gang now knows exactly where to go for the next page of the Thebius Raccoonus. The next target is Mugshot, a dog turned from scrawny nerd to ruthless gangster as a result of being bullied as a child. Nowadays, he's holed up in Mesa City, a usually thriving town that is now suspiciously absent of life. Now that Sly has Raleigh's pages, he has a brand new ability. I'll let Bentley explain. Landeth safely upon diminutive points, leapeth lively and presseth the triggering device with the round geometrical object emblazoned upon it. So jump and hit the circle button to land on narrow spots. That's a rough translation. I love the dialogue and mannerisms of the characters. Every small detail just oozes with charm. Sly moves through Mesa City, taking out thugs and finding himself outside a casino with Mugshot's face all over it. These are some of my favorite levels in terms of aesthetics, with neon lights and the ability to maneuver through more urban areas this time. It's probably the most visually interesting out of the five worlds. This world isn't just about making your way through casinos and alleyways, though. It also contains more minigames. There are two remaining keys, and it's Murray's job to get them. He was challenged to a race by some gangster dogs, with the prize being a treasure key. These vehicle segments aren't too bad, but they definitely do take me a few tries every time. It always seems like the drivers get worse each time you hit retry, but I don't really have the most reliable way to check that. Side note, there's a face on the hot dog in the center? I have no idea who this is, but I found it hilarious. Next up, Murray is running towards the key while Sly snipes people from a distance keeping him safe. These levels are fine, but I do find it annoying that you can't manually zoom. The game zooms in on its own, which is definitely helpful for finding where an enemy is coming from, but it also makes it hard to keep an eye on Murray when he's being attacked from multiple sides. With the keys all stolen, Sly unlocks a car, sending it careening through the front of the main building, creating a path to the rest of the hub world. Here we get even more variety with a chase scene. Sly is racing across the rooftops going after the treasure key as Carmelita puts her Stormtrooper aim to good use. This level is where I got the best example of one of my main complaints with the game, the thief move targeting system. What? What was he trying to grab? Was he trying to grab this ladder? That didn't work very well. Gee, I just lost a life for nothing. That sucks, okay. While trying to activate a ninja spire jump, Sly targeted the ladder from across the gap and started trying to gravitate towards it, sending him to his death. 
This isn't as much of an issue in the later games, but I experienced unfair deaths like this on multiple occasions. That's never a good thing in a game that uses a lives system. Other than that issue, I actually really like the chase sequences. They're super fun, even if they are a little bit easy, and they're a great change of pace from the normal stealth levels. A few keys later, it's finally time to take out Mugshot. <laughs> what? My boys have been yapping about some big mysterious dude running around cracking skulls and... <laughs> And, and this is it? You're the monkey wrench in my operation? Some scrawny rat with a stick. Right. Wait a second. I seen that stick before. Maybe when my father knocked your block off with it. Your father? Wow. You're a Cooper? You know that Thingus Rakamagookus had a lot of nice pictures, but way too many big boys. So you don't mind just handing it over? Why? <laughs> what are you kidding? You break into my place, steal my stuff, trash the joint, I feel transgressed and violated. Let's rock! This boss fight is relatively simple, but it requires perfection. There are mirrors surrounding the edges of the arena, with Mugshot chasing after you with his guns. You have to hit each mirror with your cane in order to rotate it around. Once enough are rotated, a strong light is reflected into Mugshot and he takes damage. The entire time, you have to literally dodge bullets. The best way I've found to do this is to use the dive moves from earlier and just try your best to anticipate his attacks. The worst part is that there are multiple levels. If you get hit once, it's all the way back to the beginning. The game does take pity on you when you die enough, giving you a horseshoe, but that takes a lot of fails to get. When you finally get to the third level, you're required to use your spire jumps to navigate around and hit more mirrors. This is painfully easy compared to the rest. All you need to do is hide behind a mirror until he shoots it, then reverse it back on him and move on to the next one. If you have a little bit of patience, it's a piece of cake. This is impossible! A little pipsqueak like you, beating a big strong bruiser like me? It ain't right! You want all of that stupid picture book? You're gonna have to go down to Haiti and cross paths with Miss Ruby. And then believe you me, you don't wanna be you! On their way to Ms. Ruby, Sly looks through Mugshot's pages of the thing as Rakamagookus. Here he learns to walk and slide on rails. Miss Ruby was born into a family of mystics. Because no one wanted to be around her, she learned to summon the dead to become her friends, becoming a criminal in the future to get revenge for her lonely childhood. This is my least favorite section of the entire game. It's all green and brown, the music is 90% banjo, and the enemies are the most frustrating to fight out of the game, with weird attacks and even weirder hitboxes. It's just not my cup of tea. This world is where I experienced my biggest glitch, and it's one that wasn't caused by the emulation. Here I tried to jump back down while looking for clue bottles and my camera got trapped behind this wall. This happened on multiple occasions. It was a complete pain, and if I didn't have an ability that would make it so I didn't die and lose a life whenever I drowned, I would have lost 4 or 5 lives here. Let's move on to the mini games, which are also very frustrating in this world. There are a couple driving and shooting segments. Both have the same issue as the crab level from World 1, with the shooting being backwards. I don't know if my controller was just backwards when I played this as a kid, but I definitely don't remember it being like this. The first one is simple, you just shoot forwards and take out ghost spawners while moving on a platform. The other one I remember being a lot harder in the remasters. You control a little boat and have to crush piranhas, collecting their oil for a flamethrower and using it to light lanterns around the swamp. These timed vehicle segments just aren't really fun for me, especially when you have to repeat them over and over again. Thankfully I got it first try during this playthrough. Then we have the chicken level, where you have to kill 50 chickens while dodging roosters carrying bombs, all within a minute and a half in order to appease a ghost with a treasure key. It's not fun, the hitboxes of the obstacles and roosters are abnormal and a pain to navigate through, and you have to listen to constant clucking and whistle blowing while you're playing. It's just unpleasant. It's time we finally get rid of Ms. Ruby and move on to the next world. Mm -hmm. I could feel that Koopa vibe coming. Most distastefully bad juju. Yeah, well you give me the creeps too, lady. Cooking up an army of ghosts isn't a very neighborly pastime. <laughs> oh, Sly! I see your mouth a moving, but all I hear is blah, blah, blah. Well, if jaws need to flop, then let them flop. See you in the next world. 
Her boss fight is a rhythm game. It's easy most of the time unless your emulator doesn't register your button presses. This is the most fun part of the entire world. Plus, the environment uses more than just mucky colors. It doesn't take much to survive the onslaught and take out Ms. Ruby. With a capital T. You go poking around his stronghold in China, you're likely to get poked back. Yeah, well, if he's anything like the rest of you, I think I'll manage. With that band-aid ripped off, we get to go to one of my favorite worlds, facing off against the Panda King. On the way to his domain, Sly looks through Ms. Ruby's pages of the Thievius Raccoonist, learning how to entirely turn it invisible, although not while moving. You can change this later by finding more pages. The Panda King was humiliated as a child. He loved creating fireworks, but people couldn't look past his shabby clothes and shunned him when he showed off his art form. Eventually, he decided to get revenge on them by using his fireworks for destruction. World 4 is is relatively basic. It's more visually impressive than World 3, but it's definitely lacking compared to most of the others. Everything is snowy and all the buildings are mostly made of wood. There's not a lot to say about the basic platforming levels other than they're enjoyable. Using invisibility is really fun and the parkour is as good as ever. There are a few mini games, but they're repeats from earlier. We have another Murray driving segment and another shooting segment. Let's get to the boss fight. I see you carry Kane of Notorious Cooper Thief Clan. Have you come here for revenge? To steal back the Thievius Raccoonus? That was my plan at first, but now I'm more interested in putting an end to your avalanche extortion racket. Why should you care if I bury a few worthless village in snow? You are a thief, just like me. No, that's only half right. I am a thief from a long line of master thieves, while you, you're just a frustrated firework artist turned homicidal pyromaniac. Insolent child, you shall pay dearly for your disrespect. Still, to honor your Cooper ancestry, I will send you to your doom with the beauty of my new firework technique, Flame Foo. This fight is kinda pathetically easy. You dodge his attacks, run up the platforms to get close, and then dodge a different set of attacks while beating the crap out of him. <laughs> Your skill with that cane is unparalleled. <coughs> Sly, I did a cross analysis of the metal used in that high tech blasting vehicle, and it turns out it can only be found in one place the Krakatoa volcano in Russia. That's got to be where we'll find the fifth member of the Fiendish Five. So get what you came for and let's get out of here! Oh my god, finally someone that just doesn't reveal the location of the next member. Sly learns about some modifications they can make to the van using the retrieved pages of the Thievius Raccoonus. By modifications, I mean gun. We now have gun. It shoots stuff, including our next target. Up next is the climax of the story, so if you want to avoid spoilers, please skip to the timestamp on screen. We were on our way to the Krakarov Volcano in Russia. While looking over what little information I had on the final member of the Fiendish Five, I began to notice something. In the four parts of the Thievius Raccoonus recovered so far, several of the pictures depict a shadowy owl-like figure, which looks very similar to the police images of the mysterious clockwork. Is this a strange coincidence, or is there something I'm missing? World 5 does not have a hub world. Sly moves from level to level following the narrative in a chronological order. As they approach the enemy tower, Sly is in charge of using their new weaponry to take out any enemies and obstacles. As they approach the tunnel leading forward, they have to lower the turret. This is inconvenient as we get to another driving segment where it would have been very useful. Murray has to destroy 60 computers before the fire slugs can manage to do the same. Another new upgrade to the van is a battering ram on the front, which definitely comes in handy since we can't have our turret. After destroying the computers, Sly enters the building. The room is swarming with traps, and Carmelita is trapped in the back. Bentley thinks it's a trap, but Sly continues forward anyway trying to save her. Unfortunately, Bentley was right, and Sly is knocked clean out by a gas trap. 
We get a hacking minigame with Bentley to try and shut down the trap. You control a little Bentley avatar and dodge enemy attacks while collecting these yellow key cubes trapped inside green vessels that deal damage to you if you collide with them. This is the only part of the game where you have a health bar, but it's kind of undermined by the fact that the enemy attacks are one-shot kills anyway. With Carmelita and Sly now safe, the two call a truce to defeat Clockwork. Unfortunately, a robot immediately steals the Cooper cane. We play as the Inspector here, providing cover fire while Sly gets his cane back and moves forward. Carmelita's jetpack sits atop a tower depicting Clockwork. The lava levels are quickly rising, so Sly needs to move fast to get to the top. He slips on the jetpack just as Clockwork rises from the magma below. Sly Cooper, you have saved my gas chamber and destroyed my death ray. Remarkable. You Coopers always find a way to beat me. Always? So that was you in the background of all those old pictures in the devious raccoons. How old are you? Perfection has no age. What? You're immortal? Revenge is the prime ingredient in the function of news. I've kept myself alive for hundreds of years with a steady diet of jealousy and hate. A reason to day when I will finally eclipse your family's thieving reputation. Sly! My missiles don't hurt him but seem to create holes in his armor. Shoot into the gaps I create! This fight is relatively straightforward. You move around to Sly, shooting at the vulnerabilities that Carmelita creates with her stun pistol. You have to dodge balls of energy and rings the entire time. Once he's finally down, we witness the world's most awkward visual transition into a mini platforming stage. Sly makes his way onto Clockwork's back, tearing the monster to pieces and escaping with his friends. So that was Sly Cooper. I still love this game, even if nowadays I definitely noticed a lot more of its faults. The art direction is masterful, although some of the worlds are definitely less visually interesting than the others. The music is great, the voice acting is great, and both of those aspects only improve as the series goes on. The gameplay is also absolutely wonderful. The level design combined with tons of different ways to move around really make a fun experience where you feel free to maneuver how you please. There were definitely quirks, especially surrounding the camera, but overall the experience was great. The combat was simple but effective, and the extra moves you get from the vaults made it so you could approach one situation in a multitude of different ways. Most of the minigames were good ways to break up the monotony of normal platforming levels, and the story was just interesting enough to be simple, engaging, and fitting for the aesthetic of the game. Overall, if you have the ability to emulate it, I would definitely give it a go. It's a relatively short game at about 5-6 to six hours. I hope you enjoyed this slight change of pace for the channel. I know it was different compared to what I normally do, but I had a ton of fun with this one, so let me know if you have any interest in me continuing to branch out a bit and do other games like this. Also, two quick announcements. First and foremost, I have a second channel now. There I'll be uploading the full gameplay recordings you used in these videos. The one for this video was done solo, but most of the time I will be playing through with guests. The other announcement is we now have a Discord server, so feel free to join and hang out, the link will be below. I hope to see you all again, have a great rest of your day.